Museo delle Terme is the epigraphic collection. It's part of Museo Nazionale Romano. And today I want to take you inside and meet with an expert who works in the museum, who's going to show us things that you've never seen before. So a little behind the scenes, a little special access to get us really close to this fabulous collection that really does narrate the history of ancient Rome. What makes this museum so extraordinary is that it's nestled within the impressive remains of the Basil Diocletian of the early 4th century AD. Let's explore the secrets of this amazing museum. Basil Diocletian truly offers you uh, one of the greatest experiences that you can have of a museum in ancient Rome because this sprawling complex really is the core of the museum structure. And in this point here, we can be outside or right there by the swimming pool, the Natatio. And we have incredible architectural features on display as well as beautiful varieties of colored marble that come from all over Rome and give us a sense of empire, give us a sense of how connected Rome was in the imperial period to the provinces all around the Mediterranean. And in the end, we also have a great example of the reuse of some of this ancient material. It's spoliated, it takes on a new life in the Renaissance times, but also in this very uh, space here, we have the remains of lime kilns, where they're actually also taking that marble and burning it down for lime for new constructions through the Middle Ages and in through the Renaissance time. This great portal, uh, it was the portal of the charter house that was built inside the Diocletian Baths in the second half of the 16th century. Uh, but we can see very clearly here how it was built. It was built uh, reusing uh, architectonical fragments coming from the baths. This is very well visible here. As you can see, we can recognize in the upper part the same uh, element that we can see in the opposite side. Um, a, a cornice, a, an architectural element uh, that decorated uh, the architrave, a part of an architrave. Uh, what uh, did the Carthusian monks uh, did? They simply detach these enormous fragments, they turn them and uh, re-sculpted uh, in order to have uh, the typical uh, decoration of the Renaissance uh, portals. Uh, the phenomenon of the spoliation is very common uh, in, uh, during the centuries in Rome. There are many more secrets to discover in the museum. Let's take a look now at gladiators. These two reliefs at my side show um, fightings of gladiators. Uh, they are similar because in both the cases we have scenes of fighting and captions that uh, indicate uh, the result of the, of the fighting and the names of uh, the gladiators that are fighting. The inscription says the names of the gladiators Scholasticus and Damascenus. We can just see their legs and we can see the body Body of Damascenus that is falling down. We know that Damascenus was killed. Uh, gladiators fought uh, uh, a death, so uh, one of them must be killed by the other one. Uh, Damascenus was killed. In fact, we can know this information by the presence of the letter uh, theta. Uh, initial Greek letter, initial of the Greek word thanatos, that means death. This relief belonged to a monument, a funerary monument, probably made by uh, the person who paid for these spectacles, while this other one probably uh, belonged to the funerary monument of one gladiator. In fact, uh, the difference between the other one is that we have the same name uh, that is not conserved and uh, the victories that uh, he had against the other gladiators. We know, for example, that this gladiator won ten times against Panteriscon. Here's another artistic treasure that deals directly with the lives of gladiators in Rome. It's not very obvious at first glance, 
let's take a look at another secret of this museum. Inscriptions are very important because they give the possibility to uh, know uh, about men and women uh, that are not so famous. Uh, we often know by the literary sources about generals, emperors, but we lost contact with uh, common people. And inscription gives us the possibility to um, make them live again. We can almost hear their voices and we can know what they wanted uh, future generation uh, know about themselves. In fact, it's the inscription that reveals the history of the deceased in the tomb. It was dedicated by Aurelia Maximina, who was the wife of Julius Achilles, who was being honored here. He lived 47 years and 10 months, and he was an equestrian and the director of the Ludus Magnus. And the Ludus Magnus is one of four gladiatorial schools right in the shadow of the Colosseum built in the age of Domitian. Now, this gentleman lived in the third century AD. But the Ludus Magnus had a very long life and we can see the remains still today partially excavated. What's so exciting about this museum is you can connect real people to real physical locations that you can explore throughout the city today. The Ludus Magnus being the gladiator school featured in a Gladiator with Russell Crowe. It was the biggest, which means that this arena held up to 3,000 spectators that could watch the gladiators, the famed gladiators, train, getting ready for the performance inside the Colosseum. And in fact, there is a tunnel that connects the Ludus to the Colosseum. It's never been fully excavated, but there was that private connection linking these barracks where the gladiators fought and trained, getting ready for the big event in the Colosseum, a discreet way to get themselves inside the Colosseum. And it's only partially excavated, but it is still a marvelous ruin from ancient Rome. This is the small cloister of the Charter House of St. Mary of the Angels, Santa Maria degli Angeli. Every Charter House, in fact, has two cloisters, a bigger one and a smaller one, and this is the smaller one. In 2014, uh, this small cloister uh, was reopened to public and dedicated to the most important uh, cults uh, of the Roman times. Here in particular, we are in front of the inscriptions of the um, Arval brothers, Fratres Arvales, a very important priesthood uh, that according to the legend was created by uh, Romulus himself. So it's the most ancient cult and it was dedicated to Dea Dia, the goddess of the shining light, who produced fertility in the fields, Arva, so Arvales is connected to the field. This suburban sanctuary with the sacred grove was located at the fifth mile of the Via Campana or Solaria. And what is so fascinating is that the archaeological evidence is so rich. Besides the temple, there are these dedications, these vast inscriptions on marble panels, and they stretch on through the entire centuries of the imperial period. So you have them going from the Julio-Claudian period all the way to end of empire. And in this display, in the small cloister, you also have them now paired with the original ancient portraits of famous Roman emperors. It's a great way to explore the history of Roman religion of the imperial period, and also take a look at the lives of the emperors that were honored by the Arval Brethren over the centuries. You see, we have just opened the showcase for you to show you one of the most important uh, items of our museum. A very impressive element, a bronze horse harness dating to the 80th century before Christ. Uh, this 
uh, item is unique because it's the first uh, reference to the legend of the birth of Rome. In fact, the decoration that you can see here uh, shows uh, two uh, figures, a male figure and a female figure. The female figure is breastfeeding a child and the male figure is blinded by two vultures. So this particular, the vultures that are blinding a man, is uh, uh, um, an element that probably refers to uh, the legend of Aeneas and Kisses uh, and uh, uh, the descendants that will uh, create Romulus and Remus, so then Rome. In particular, uh, Anchises, Aeneas' father, uh, was blinded because he uh, gloried himself because he uh, had a relationship with Venus, uh, goddess of love and mother of uh, Aeneas. So uh, his punishment uh, is here represented. And so probably this is the most ancient uh, uh, reference to this legend because from Aeneas coming from Troy, uh, we have a strictly connection uh, between Greek culture and Roman culture. The descendant of uh, Aeneas' son uh, will be uh, the uh, ancestors of Romulus and Remus. We hope you enjoy the secrets of the museum and special thanks to Dottoressa Caruso for her time and passion. We'll be back to the museum and we'll be going to so many other locations. To get more access, be sure to subscribe to our newsletter at ancientromelive.org to tap into our live lectures on location in Rome and throughout the empire.